form. So when n equals 1, that's just a real surface with a volume form or an area form. There's a special kind of submanifold called a Lagrangian. So this is an n-dimensional submanifold on which the symplectic form vanishes. So when n equals 1, that's just a curve. And if you want something more non-trivial to have in your head, for m, you can take the phase space of a Hamiltonian dynamical system. And if it's integrable, you can take L to be the common level set of a maximal family of comp commuting integrals. The Fukai category is a way of encoding all or a large collection of the Lagrangians inside of M, and an intersection theory which is robust in some symplectic sense. So this is something like a category. Um, the objects are the Lagrangians. And um, as long as your two Lagrangians intersect transversely, HOM from one to the other is a formal sum, or HOMs are formal sums of intersection points. Now, in order for this to be a category, you should have a composition operation. And I'll tell you what that is on generators. So take A and B intersections of L2 and L1, respectively L1 and L0, and C an intersection of L2 and L0. Um, and I should tell you what the coefficient of C is in the composition of A and B. Uh, and so we define this to be a count of pseudo-holomorphic triangles. Um, and what that means is it's a pseudo-holomorphic map from a thrice-punctured disk into M. So it turns out you can always equip M with a well-behaved um, complex structure on its tangent bundle, and it doesn't matter too much which you choose. Um, and then the three Lagrangians prescribe your boundary conditions, and you require that the map is asymptotic to A, B, and C at the punctures. So uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how much you like homological algebra, that is not an associative com uh, composition operation. Um, but it turns out that if you uh, um, sort of enrich your category by counting rigid polygons, where instead of just taking in two inputs, you take in an arbitrary number of inputs. So you do the same kind of picture as here, except you have uh, a d plus 1 times punctured disk for a d area operation. Then you get a fairly well-behaved object called an A-infinity category. So that's what the Fukai category is. It's an A-infinity category. And um, this algebraic structure called an infinity category comes from the combinatorics of the moduli spaces of domains. So here's a picture of the first three of these moduli spaces of domains. And what I mean by that is starting with uh, the one relevant to the binary operation, for instance, called K2, we consider all configurations of three marked points on the boundary of the disk up to complex automorphism. And of course, there's just one of them. So K2 is a single point. With K3, you can use um, complex automorphisms to fix the positions of three of the points. So for instance, this distinguished output point and maybe the top and the bottom of the two inputs. But you have that middle input left over, and that can slide back and forth. So K4 is a whole interval. And we compactify that to the uh, closed interval by adding in um, what happens when that middle input collides with either the, the top input or the bottom input. And what happens is uh, we sprout off another disk where those two points involved in the collision live. K4 is a pentagon, and so forth and so on. So in general, these, um, these uh, post sets of degenerations <laughs> can be realized as the face post sets of a family of polytopes called stash F polytopes or associahedra. Now, the, the thing that I've been thinking about for a while is how to implement a notion of functoriality for the Fukai category, which isn't baked into the definition. And unfortunately, I don't have time to really develop um, uh, how this functoriality should, should work on the most basic level. Um, but I'll tell you that building on ideas of Mao, Verheim, and Woodward, and Alan Weinstein, um, a couple of years ago, I suggested that, uh, that 
functoriality should, should manifest as um, a way of binding together a large collection of Fukaya categories of different symplectic manifolds. So specifically, um, there's this idea of constructing some two-category-like thing called simp, the symplectic A and infinity two-category, where the objects are symplectic manifolds, and HOM from M to N is the Fukaya category of the product. Um, and so like I said, uh, that probably is just noise if you're hearing it for the first time. Um, but I'm going to just totally forget the motivation for pretty much the rest of the talk and just tell you that the, the structure maps in this object are going to be given by counting something that's similar in spirit to those pseudo-holomorphic polygons. They're called witch balls. So uh, one of them is pictured, whoops, pictured here. These are uh, two equivalent views. And the way you define one of these things is you start out by taking the plane, you draw some vertical lines, you put some points on the vertical lines. That's a domain. So one of them is right here. There don't have to be four lines in this number of mark points. That's just a representative example. And then you choose some symplectic manifolds called M0 up through M4 here, and require the different patches to map into those respective manifolds um, with boundary or so-called seam conditions given by Lagrangians in the product of the adjacent symplectic manifolds. OK, great. Um, so let me tell you about what I did last year. Um, the first thing that you're going to need to do when you want to um, define a structure like this is understand what, uh, you know, what algebraic structure should result from these pseudo-holomorphic counts, uh, just as the algebraic nature of the Fukai category came from the degenerations that can occur inside of the moduli space of configurations of points on the boundary of a disk. So we need to understand um, what kind of degenerations can occur inside of the moduli space of these configurations of vertical lines and points. Um, and when I say moduli space, what I mean is um, we're going to allow these vertical lines to move back and forth and the points to move up and down on the lines. Um, and we quotient out by positive dilation and translation, but you can forget about that for now. So here's an example. This is um, when you have three vertical lines and two mark points on the left line. I've drawn them as disks, but they're equivalent. Um, so for instance, one thing that could happen is these two points could collide. And when that happens, you sprout a red disk. So that's this edge down here. Another thing that could happen is the, the line between, or the circle between the, the red and the yellow portions could expand until it hits the boundary. And then there's two possibilities depending on whether the mark points um, simultaneously coll collide as that degeneration happens. So if they do, you'll get this edge here. And if they don't, you'll get this guy. Um, so something I was able to do is show that um, there's a couple of nice ways of encoding the combinatorics of these degenerations, um, either in terms of these uh, funny dashed and solid trees or in terms of these bracketings. Uh, and so very briefly, let me just mention that for these bracketings, um, what this, the way it goes is, uh, first of all, you take the numbers 1 up through R, where R is the number of lines, and you put those on the bottom row. And then you stack up letters above each of the numbers corresponding to the, the mark points on that line. And then you draw circles around, um, around the letters corresponding to uh, where the mark points live on the various bubbles. So for instance, we could look at this guy here, the bottom left corner of that pentagon. So the two red points have collided and bubbled off. So that's why there's this bracket around the A and the B. And then the two interior circles collided. So that's why there's this bracket around the two and the three. So the point is that uh, you can prove that uh, you can really get a sensible post set, and it turns out to be an abstract polytope. Um, and um, just to show you a bit of the richness of these things, this bad boy is W22, which is three dimensional. Um, so you can build it by cutting it out along the boundary, folding along the edges, and gluing together the appropriate pairs of boundary edges. Uh, and if you're a combinatorics nerd, this is not simple. So for instance, there's a vertex with four edges coming out. Do you understand the facets of this polytope? Yes. 
Yeah, so they're all the bracketing diagrams with only one bracket, depending on what you mean by understand it. You can write the inequalities down, I mean, false. Inequalities on? The facets, but other facets. Oh, oh, I see what you mean. No, I have no idea. Um, so it's not, <laughs> that, that's not too relevant for my purpose, um, but yeah, I am curious if there's a way of um, doing that nicely. Yeah. OK, and then the last thing I want to mention about the algebraic structure is that um, it has an operad-like structure. Um, and the reason that I care about that is because that's what you need to define this notion of A infinity 2 category that was the motivation for looking at these moduli spaces in the first place. So that's the, the sort of canister for functoriality for the Fukai category. Um, and uh, you know, it sounds scary relative to operad, but it's really simple. It's just saying that uh, if you look at this facet of this uh, three-dimensional two-associohedron, um, <clears throat> I guess I didn't say it, but these things are called two-associohedra. So if you look at this facet, uh, you can sort of decompose it as a fiber product of smaller two-associohedra, uh, just one for each of the disks here. OK, great. Um, so lastly, I want to tell you a little bit about what I'd like to do this fall. Um, so now that I think I understand the algebraic structure pretty well, I'd like to get my hands on some concrete computations in really simple situations. Um, and I have a few ideas about how to do that, but I'll tell you about one of them. Uh, so there's this work that Kenji Fukaya and Yang Ano did in the mid-90s, which was um, uh, essentially to compute the Fukaya category of a cotangent bundle. So B is any smooth manifold. Uh, it turns out that there's a way of equipping that with a symplectic form in a natural way. Um, <clears throat> now, for now, I'm not going to care about the symplectic form, but I will care about the complex structure on the tangent bundle. Um, so we're going to define that by choosing a metric G. Um, we'll use that to identify the tangent bundle of the cotangent bundle as a direct sum of the tangent and cotangent bundles. So that should have been an O plus. Whoops. Um, and we'll define a, a complex structure on the tangent bundle depending on this parameter epsilon in terms of that decomposition uh, according to this matrix right here. So the point is basically that by doing this, uh, as long as epsilon is small, we're making the fibers small relative to the base. <clears throat> so what Fukai and O did is uh, they analyzed what the J epsilon holomorphic strips and in general polygons look like um, as long as the boundaries on the graphs of the exact one forms. Um, and they succeeded. So here's what they did. They said, uh, for small epsilon, um, the strips that you're counting um, become approximately linear in the fibers. So that's a very non-trivial statement and it took them maybe 40 or 50 pages of hardcore analysis to do. But anyway, the upshot is that um, if you take one of these uh, pseudo-holomorphic strips, so that's a map from the strip into T star B that's pseudo-holomorphic and has a uh, boundary on those graphs, um, then if you look at this or any other vertical segment, uh, it's contained in a single fiber uh, and it's linear. And in fact, you know what the endpoints have to be. They're just um, DF1 at this point P and DF0. Um, and then you use the fact that this strip has to be J epsilon holomorphic. And that tells you that, um, that the projection down to the base, which I'm calling P, satisfies this differential equation here. Um, and after reparameterizing, that's just saying that it's a Morse flow line of the difference of the two functions. Um, so the point is that, uh, that um, the unary operation in the Fukai category, which is just a differential on this HOM set, um, can be identified with the differential of the Morse complex. Um, so that tells you, in particular, that um, the homology of that complex is just the singular homology of the base. Uh, great. And you can do something similar with the, the polygons that you need to count in order to um, define the Fukai category. So um, this is what um, one of these polygons looks like. It's, this is the image for small epsilon. It's degenerating to this tree of Morse flow lines. Um, so what I'm wondering is, how about doing this for these witch balls? So here's an example uh, witch ball with just two seams and one marked point. Um, and I have some idea about what 
more theoretic data you'd like to identify this with, but I haven't proved it yet, so I won't uh, tell it to you in public. Um, so yeah, that's all. And if anyone would like to think about a maybe interesting adiabatic limit with me, come and let's chat. So thanks for your attention. <laughs>